Hey, hi everyone. Thank you so much for listening to Beyond Eight Figures. This is AJ, the journeyman entrepreneur with another Beyond Eight Figure episode for you. On the show, we talk with top entrepreneurs about the realities of building an eight figure business, what success really means to them, and hear from them about some of their winning strategies and tactics. Tune in to each episode to learn how to grow your business beyond 10 million, and more importantly, create your own personal legacy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Beyond Eight Figures, a podcast about the realities of building and scaling a business, well, to Beyond Eight Figures. This is AJ, your host, your journeyman entrepreneur, and today we're going to speak a little bit about the next step in entrepreneurship, everyone's favorite topic, exiting. Today's guest has been an entrepreneur since 1995, starting and selling six businesses, all for beyond seven or eight figures. Today, his program, Exit DNA, offers busy entrepreneurs and founders the necessary information and the exact steps to prepare for a successful exit. I find the idea of preparing your business to sell and understanding when it's best to get ready really important since uh, my last exit. I did not, and I am regretting it to this day, but we'll leave our guest today to tell you a little bit about it himself in a second. He's a man of many talents. He's an ex-professional soccer player. Nowadays, he's helping hundreds of entrepreneurs every day. So welcome back to Beyond Eight Figures, Mac Lackey. You know, it's been about a year. What's been going on since the last time you were here? Gosh, a year, yeah. Other than the (laughs) global pandemic, right? (laughs) Yeah, but some small year. Yeah, so um, I think like a lot of people, it was a really interesting year for me because I, um, I already was working from home. I had already set up my life in a lot of ways, sort of optimized around, you know, what I wanted to focus on. But a lot of my plan for 2020 was speaking at events and trying to just help entrepreneurs. And so I had, you know, speaking engagements booked in Europe. I had them booked on the West Coast and all these cool things I was excited about. And those just sort of fell away with the the travel bans. And so, you know, I guess as much as anything, I focused on the same thing, which was my exit DNA program, working with founders. But it was really, you know, reimagined in terms of delivering it over Zoom, finding people I could help over Zoom. Um, and that was new for me. You know, I've not, I've been a, I would say a reasonably good marketer of my companies when I was an entrepreneur, but I certainly was not and still am getting better at marketing myself and how I can help people. And so that was sort of fast track. So yeah, that's been, that's been a big learning experience for me. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's been intellectually challenging um, to you know think differently about how to promote myself, my programs. Uh, but yeah, my, my focus has remained pretty consistent. You know, mentoring, advising, investing in founders, and then a couple of cool little you know opportunities have bubbled up. But that's that's been pretty consistent for me this this past year. Nice. Do you think some of the, you know because. I want to kind of touch on you know your background as an entrepreneur because you've been doing this so long and you've had you know what looks in hindsight like success is success, but obviously it probably was a little bit choppier in your shoes. Um, but you talk about some of the things that have bubbled up. How do you see like one both how COVID have, you know infected the how those bubbled up but also like your experience of what you've done so where you are now capable of doing for these opportunities yeah one thing that's really interesting um you know steve jobs had that that great commencement address at stanford and he talked about connecting dots you know only really works looking backwards and uh you know now that i have the benefit of 25 years of, of hindsight uh looking back over a long journey you know, I can sort of see a pattern that I adopted early in my career that now is like deja vu again and again and again. And that's basically just really committing to listening and 
just being super curious about what's going on in the world. And so early on, that sort of execution was, I was an entrepreneur in a town that didn't have entrepreneurs. I was an entrepreneur before it was cool to be an entrepreneur. So I just had to constantly listen and learn because I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anyone to show me the path. Well, fast forward, you know, a decade later, that same sort of intellectual curiosity was helping me see trends really, really early. I think, you know, one of the things I haven't done that many things right, but one of the things I did right uh, pretty consistently was get on a trend early. You know, I launched my first business web 1.0 company shortly after Netscape launched the commercial web browser. You know, I was in the you know, content is king category before someone said content is king, you know. So I think the same thing is is playing out now. And COVID was really, really a good example of that is I just kept asking myself, what's going to change as a result of this new dynamic? What's going to remain the same? What are other people doing? And just that constant really questioning what's going on I don't know, it's almost like little bright lights sort of, you know, appear and like, oh, there's something I want to lean into. I want to learn more about that or I want to think about that more deeply. Um, So, you know, long story short, I think I felt it a lot in the past year because there was so much change going on as a result of COVID. It accelerated that natural process of me just asking a lot of questions. Um, But, yeah, that's something that's that's. I don't know, really served me well. And I, and I felt it a lot in 2020. What are you seeing, you know, from the people in your program for the exit DNA? Cause I definitely think that preparation for getting ready, even if you're not going to sell to get ready to sell is really important. Cause I completely, I, I got lucky in selling my last company. Um, but it was on the way down. I didn't know prep ahead of time or I did very poor prep. Um, And I recognize after the fact in looking at your stuff and looking at other people talking about, you know, that how different just a little bit of effort would have been in how that exit looked. So what are you seeing now with people with everything going on? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I, I think, um, I've seen the quote attributed to Buffett and also Einstein, but you know that compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. So whoever said that, I sort of think about exit prep the same way. It's like, you know, if you're starting a company tomorrow and you started doing little things tomorrow just to be thoughtful about your future potential exit, you just might want to do it a decade in the future those little things that you do from the earliest stages compound into really significant value over time. And so as a strategy, you know, being thoughtful and proactive about exit prep is just a simple thing to do, but it creates a ton of value. The reality is just like your example, what most people do is there's a point in time, some trigger event, some need, or desire to sell a company, positive or negative, and that's when they say, okay, now I need to get ready. And so the window is is short. It may be two months, it may be, you know, nine months, whatever it is, but that's not really enough time to let all of those simple things you could have done compound into value. Now what you're basically doing is scrambling to put as many pieces together as you can. And so- Lipstick on the pig. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so I, I kind of, as a core philosophy, I tell people in exit DNA, like that's one of the big critical shifts you have to make is it doesn't matter if you ever wanna sell your company or not, what you really want is you want the option. And one of the ways to create the option is to decide immediately that you're gonna be proactive about it. And once you kind of make that mental shift, those things start to happen. So again, that's a core philosophy for me. It's something I talk about every day within our program. But what 2020 did is highlight for a lot of people things that I used to say before 2020 that people would look at me and think, yeah, I think Max being a little dramatic or he's being a little crazy. But I used to say, you really never know 
what's going to happen to the macroeconomic environment. Maybe we go into a recession. Maybe, you know, some factor that's out of your control. And now you can see because of 2020, most companies had a very black or white outcome. You know, March of 2020 either started an immediate negative (laughs) decline of their business or for some, you know, maybe D to C e-commerce companies, it was a rocket boost. And I was working with a company, I was on the board of a company that was planning to sell for eh, probably, you know, 25, 30, 40 million um, in 2020. By April or May, it was hoping to make it to the end of the year. You know, that's how dramatic these outcomes are. And so my point is, you know, that's an extreme example. But man, if you are prepared and you have the option, you can you can do things proactively in an instant and create maybe the exit value would have gone down to 20 million. Who cares? You know, so so, yeah, I think 2020 for me was actually helpful in highlighting something I've been saying for a long time that I think people thought maybe Max just paranoid because I'm always talking about factors out of your control and 2020 hit it with a highlighter. Like sometimes you just don't control. So, well, one of the things I liked and I you know, dug in, you're talking about kind of doing this proactive work, but in diving through, like I talk about this cause I'm a marketer, but I like, there's always, you know, when I talk with clients, there's always so much noise. There's do this, do that, do this. In reading, look, wearing my business owner hat, what I loved was the way you outlined, not like, oh, we're gonna do all these things, we're gonna prepare you, but you actually had a, a bit of a process. Would you kind of, you know, talk a little bit about how you help people deal with the noise to get ready? Yeah, because there's always a gazillion pieces of advice. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, there, there are lots of little things you can do, but there, there are some critical shifts I think people need to make. And so I, I you know, talk a lot about these critical shifts. One is, is the, the notion I already mentioned, which is going from reactive to proactive, just making the decision that you're going to design your company so you have the option to exit. Just literally making that mental shift starts to put some things in motion. The biggest shift uh, or shifts, I'd say there are probably two or three that I, I think uh, people need to make. One is, you know, of my six personal exits, I never sold for a financial multiple. I never sold for an EBITDA or a revenue multiple. I always sold based on what I call strategic value. And that's a really, really big and important shift for founders to make, which is, you know, not that your EBITDA doesn't matter, not that your revenue growth doesn't matter. Of course it does. But if you take a little bit of time to start thinking about what are the things that we're creating that are really powerful and unique and strategic, those are the real drivers of exits. You know, the reason someone comes in and buys your company is not because it's doing 2 million or 20 million in revenue. It's because you created a product that's, you know, creating so much demand in the market that people have given you $20 million. That product in the hands of a buyer or the intellectual property you've created or the distribution channel, those are the things that actually drive acquisitions. And so I I really try to reframe how people think about the assets they're creating so that they have that sort of exit potential. Um, The the other one that I I really, really like is is helping people think differently about who is going to buy their company. You know, I was on the phone with with someone literally yesterday, which one of my clients, members, and it illustrated the point so well. They have a multi-generational business has been around probably 40, 50 years, and they are going to exit. And they did what almost every single founder on earth will do, which is they will say, okay, let's find a larger version of ourselves because that's the logical buyer. Someone that's doing, if you're an Amazon seller and you're doing 2 million in revenue, you want to find someone at 20 or a hundred million because that's who will buy it. And the reality is the best buyers, the ones that pay the biggest premiums that lead to the best exits are people outside your industry 
that are trying to break in. So you, you know, helping founders open up the aperture of who all might be interested in buying my company across multiple categories and then helping them line up what is that, what I call the irresistible exit story so that it becomes a no brainer. Why would someone in this new industry absolutely love to buy your company? So a lot of what we do is just really helping founders, you know, reframe these things and then start actively working through them. So that's kind of my, you know, incredibly high level. I'm happy to go into details, but very high level. It's almost about reframing how founders have thought about creating value and then how they find the right buyers. Well, who are your, you know, besides just entrepreneurs, what do they look like? You know, who are your, you know, I don't want to throw an avatar and all that craziness, but what type of businesses are best for, you know, working with you? What type of entrepreneurs are best for working with you? Yeah, I would say, you know, one of the the real luxuries I've I've had to some degree is is my companies, my primary businesses that I built were in multiple industries, you know, a couple of tech companies, a couple of media companies, an apparel company. Um, and then my exits were also reasonably diversified, public companies, private companies, international, domestic buyers. And so my own set of experiences was reasonably diverse. I would say they were, they were largely more modern tech enabled businesses. So even if I were doing something with apparel, it was, you know, tech enabled and high growth, right? But the reason I say that is because um, I f- have not really found a category or an industry that I'm like, eh, yeah, I just don't know how to help a founder in that category. I do think the ones that I tend to naturally migrate to and find the most success with are those, you know, more traditional high growth categories. So, you know, tech, software, um, healthcare, you know, all all those kind of things. But um, the other sort of, yeah, guardrails, I guess I would say is my sweet spot sort of feels like once a founder's business or an entrepreneur's business is doing seven figures in revenue, so it's, you know, over a million, but it's really um, kind of from that point up until like mid eight figures that I feel where I can create the most value. You know, can I help someone doing 100 million revenue? Sure, but it's it's a different ball game at that point. So the perfect scenario for me is probably a, you know, mid seven to low eight figure founder, first time exit potential in the future in one of those kind of growth businesses. Those are the companies that for me to add, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, if not, you know, significant millions to exit value just because we're doing things so differently feels very straightforward. So that's, that's kind of the sweet spot. No, that is a good sweet spot because, you know, I got up to, you know, upper seven figures before coming back down to low before bringing it back to mid with my last. And yeah, it's so choppy and the planning and stuff. That is a really good spot because, you kind of get all excited once you hit seven. You're like, whoa. And then you, it's not that it's, it's not that it's harder. It's just more complex. You know, that's why I tell people. And then that like 3 million. Yeah. And then 5 million, you're like, uh, I'm not sleeping much anymore. <laughs> seven million, yeah. Yeah. So I definitely see that's a good spot. And that's definitely some, something I know from my experience, someone like you would be really great. You know, listening to people have been through it, but then also have had the opportunity to learn multiple times. Definitely. How long, you know, you're saying around the mid seven figures, do you say like, Hey, come a year before you're interested or Hey, come. And this is a journey for whatever feels appropriate, you know, ongoing. In terms of our program, you mean? Yeah. Working with yeah. you. So I would say, you know, the absolute perfect scenario for a a founder or an entrepreneur running a company is if you are more than a year away from an exit, and I think the sweet spot is is probably one to three, um, 
it is absolutely perfect because you have just enough time to really start creating a lot of value and letting it sort of, you know, compound as we discussed. But it's not so far out in the future that there's no motivation to do the work. Um, so a lot of the people I work with don't know if they're going to exit for sure. They're trying to evaluate what that looks like. They're trying to create that option. But most of them would say, I'd say over 50% of the people I work with would say, you know what, if I could exit in the next couple of years feeling like I maximize value, that's a great spot. Um, I, I tend to say, you know, kind of no to people that want to exit in less than a year unless I have really unique insights to their industry, or I know someone that probably would already be interested in buying it or something, uh, because it's just, you know, they're going to look back, you know, and, and the reality is they'll look back knowing they left millions on the table because they didn't give it enough time. So that's kind of my zone where I feel really good. No, I like that. And that definitely from, I know my experience that probably would have been perfect in there. Um, given, you know, and you had referenced even some of the opportunities that came up, given you know, your multiple exits and sort of your journey of sort of kind of continually building on your entrepreneurial success, entrepreneurial success. Um, do you also work with, you know, entrepreneurs about what it's going to be like, you know, or why they're exiting, what that piece is? Cause I've seen a lot and I know for myself, it's nice to have an exit, but it's not, Unless you really have that big, you know, whatever is your magic number exit, um, you're you're not you're not done, you know, either from you know either from intellectual curiosity or just yes, you may be better off financially, but you are still in need of generating cash. So, do you also work with your people on that? Yeah, I think it's it's a really key insight. You know, one of the questions I try to figure out, whether it's it's someone I'm working with or even in a casual conversation. You know, I had a, a, a call with a founder yesterday who was not in my program, but I was trying to be helpful. And, and he said he was debating raising capital or selling his company. And so I said, well, let's let's dig into your motivations. You know, what's really driving particularly the need to or desire to raise capital, because that really changes the dynamic um, around your business. And so the more we talked about it, the more clear it became that this individual, and this is pretty common, really feels like he was a, a, an idea person. He's really capable at getting something started and going and moving and then kind of runs out of his interest and ability to get it to the next level. I can completely relate. I would say if anything, my businesses, even though they were, you know, I was very fortunate to have, you know, seven, multiple seven, multiple eight figure exits. I sold early, you know, I sold quick and early because I recognized a couple things. One is it was not going to be my last rodeo. You know, I knew an exit for me was not my only shot because I knew I was going to start my next company. Um, so even if it was a couple million dollars and maybe that's not enough for me to you know, sit on a beach, I knew that this is just part of the journey. The other was being sort of realistic with myself that I wasn't sure I was personally capable of getting it to nine figures. And so I think digging in with founders on what are the criteria that you're using to evaluate if and when you sell. I have a whole session that's literally called evaluating if and when you sell. And we look at five factors across their industry, macroeconomics, uh, their personal financial situation, the human dynamics around them, whether it's investors or employees or people that might affect it. And so I really recommend, you know, every founder looks at their business as, you know, from a kind of 360 degree view, all these different factors. Because the reality is most people will have a single factor that drives the decision. You know, I need to sell because I need to fund my kid's college. I 
need to sell because I've got debt to pay off. I want to sell because I want to retire in two years. Like there's some usually trigger event and those things are fine, except there typically are four or five other pretty material factors that may say, you know, it would be better to sell now than to wait two years. If you're an Amazon business and you're seeing the consolidation that's happening right now, you're placing a pretty big bet if you don't sell into the consolidation. You're basically saying, I'm going to be one of the few that survives on the backside with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of private equity coming into the market. And I'm going to wait until the next cycle happens. So I think those, you know, industry and macroeconomic factors often get ignored and they're, and they're pretty significant. So very long winded answer to your question. But yes, I really try to help the founder spin their business around a couple different angles to look at if and when they sell and what the big motivations are. Right now with everything going on, we kind of talked about like, look, things are changing, you're adapting to this, you know, the Zoom environment, the virtual environment more, even though you've been doing it. What are you seeing out there that though is really exciting to you, you know, from the space of opportunities? Yeah, I think, I think what um, has happened over multiple decades um, when I talk to young entrepreneurs, I think it's it's really funny. Um, my second company, which was, you know, really progressive at the time. I mean, it was it was cutting edge in so many ways. We raised two million dollars from friends and family, kind of angel investors, and I spent one million dollars of that two million building a content management tool and a and a very rudimentary e-commerce tool. And, and I tell people, you know, now like that is basically, you know, WordPress and like for $19 a month, you can do what I spent a million dollars on, you know, and, and had to hire, you know, 20 engineers to build. And so the thing that, that is really exciting now, and I think again, COVID was an accelerator to some of this is the ability to stand up a company and launch something and reach the market is a fraction of the money and time that it was even two years ago. So what I'm seeing now is this ability to create significant value really, really fast if you're focused on the wrong, excuse me, the right things. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about technology anymore. You don't have to worry about, you know, an engineering team anymore. You have to really think about product market fit, intellectual property. And if you get those things right, you can just turn up the volume. And so I'm, I'm super encouraged and motivated by that. Um, I think there's another factor that people really need to consider, which is I have this um, chart. I often, if I'm speaking at events or doing a webinar, I always share this founder's journey. And one of the key points of the founder's journey is that so many companies tap out at a couple, couple different levels, you know, and one big consideration is if you are going to exit, oftentimes the early exit is the easier exit, you know, so rather than getting to, let's say, um, $2 million in revenue and then saying, okay, I'm going to go get venture capital because I've proven something and we're going to get it up to 20 or 30 million in revenue. The reality for a founder is you're, if you sell now for $5 million, you may put 3 million in your pocket. Maybe it's 4 million. But if you raise venture capital and you get the company to 25 million in revenue, you may five, six years later put two or $3 million in your pocket if everything goes well. So sometimes, you know, creating value quickly and doing the early exit is actually easier than getting up to that next level and creating the big exit because you're diluted. You have other people that are dictating the outcomes. You have other variables to consider. And I think a lot of founders don't understand that. They're like, oh, if I get to 100 million, I'm going to make so much money. Well, that isn't always the case. The math might dictate that you're better off with an early exit while you control the cap table. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it is. And just being on the buying side now, all of a sudden, you know, that I'm going out looking to acquire smaller businesses, seeing businesses that in the past would have raised a few rounds now being available for sale, you know, it is an interesting thing. I think not, it's still small given the total marketplace of availability, but I do think some entrepreneurs are starting to think that way. And it's an interesting piece, you know, where, you, you know, value is being generated further down or there's more opportunity to generate value earlier into the development cycle of a company. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think the, the really interesting proxy for this for so many years was in like the, the food and beverage space, which I've never done anything specifically, but people used to always ask, you know, why does Anheuser-Busch or Pepsi or Coke buy all these little vitamin waters and you know it's like oh well that's that's where the innovation happens and it happens quickly and somebody finds product market fit and proves something out and then pepsi or anheuser-busch or coke or whoever says we have all the distribution and all the resources in the world like I, you know yeah of course they could put a team on developing that or they can just buy it early and take it to the moon and so there have been a lot of examples of that happening in certain industries, but now I think it's becoming like the de facto uh, corporate innovation strategy is like, let's just acquire innovation early and fast. So, yeah, it's funny because um, the agency I sold five years ago, we did a lot of work with the large CPA, CPG, CPA is great, CPG companies, and there are indeed groups and I used to laugh and only with friendly members of my clients, it's like, you know, we're spending more money than it costs YouTube to get started, you know, and we have no revenue. You know, we could have, look, there's five companies doing, you know, what you're trying to. And now, yeah, you know, just, you know, I've been out, you know, it's been five plus years. So now I am seeing them. That is, you know, outsourcing R&D is a huge thing and it's kind of a fun part for entrepreneurs, giving you more opportunities. Um, you have, you know, you have two children. I think you're, you know, you have a 17 year old. I thought I saw you had a picture of your daughter for her birthday on Instagram. My daughter shoots me if I put more than, you know, pre-approved on an occasional basis. <laughs> but um, how old are your kids? You had mentioned. So yeah, I have two two daughters who are seventeen and twenty. So one in college, oh, okay. one in high school. All right. So you're you're much further. I my oldest is sixteen, then I have a fourteen and a ten. So you've already gone into that next phase. So talking about your businesses, the multiple, you know, all this great stuff. Um, you know, and then you know, you've lived in Spain, you know, all this. Do you think about building a legacy, either? you know, do you even think about building a legacy and what that means? Yeah, it's, it, well, there's a couple of things that are, that are interesting. It, it, it certainly seems consistent with, with people, right? As you hit these, these certain milestones, some of which are your age, your success or lack of success, the age of your kids, all those kind of things sort of are factors. And a lot of them are converging for me about the same time, you know, I turn 50 next week. Um, I have my, thank you. Yeah. I have my 25th wedding anniversary this year. Uh, so, you know, this is a big year for, you know, those kind of dates. My, um, oldest daughter turns 21, my youngest turns 18, you know, one's in college, one's about to go to college. And so I think it's, it's really become, natural for me to think about what does the second half of my life look like and what does the legacy look like. What I think is interesting is um, I, I basically started that thinking back in 2018 when I sold my sixth company, I sort of felt like, all right, to some degree, I've checked the boxes. You know, I've, I've been, I've made a million mistakes, but I've done a few things right um, I'm, I'm really happy with the life I've lived. I made the right decisions when my daughter was born, which, you know, is a whole long story, but I, not only did I, you know, build and exit my companies, 
you know, I coach my daughter's soccer teams. I carve their pumpkins. I drove them to school. I ate dinner with them every night. So my prioritization of life felt really good. And I thought, you know, I've been blessed and fortunate. I need to sort of turn that back on how can I help others? And especially because, you know, I had amazing support from, from my family, um, my, my parents, my wife, you know, in, in terms of being able to take the kind of risk I took at a very young age. And I see a lot of founders and entrepreneurs now, and I'm particularly concerned about the trade-off that they're told they need to make. If you listen to, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, and I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Gary Vaynerchuk in terms of what he's done, and I don't know him personally, but he also is really vocal, you know, about the hustle and the grind. And I fear that a lot of people are going to wake up in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever, and look back and say, maybe I made a couple million dollars or whatever, but I wasn't engaged in my kids' lives or my health is deteriorated and now who cares? And so I'm pretty passionate about that, you know, and, and the execution of that right now is through working directly with founders in Exit DNA because that gives me a vehicle to do it. But as I think about legacy, it's something in there where I'm hoping that, you know, in some very small way, a group of people will credit me with helping them not accept that trade off and make the kind of decisions that they're happy and proud about, you know? So I don't, I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but that's the way I've been you know, thinking about it. No, I like that a lot. Cause yeah, that I think as an entrepreneur, you know, the best thing you can do is, you know, take care of your family, but then create opportunity by the things you create for others and keep expanding. So having you know, people on that. Well, um, this has been really great and I really appreciate it. And I would love, um, love to have you back on the show one day soon because I think there's going to be more conversation about the stratification of entrepreneurship and that exit and what it means to exit and all that as we, as the space moves forward. So getting your insight into that would be great. Um, I definitely think, you know, listeners, you should go check out um, exitdna.com and maclackey.com about these programs because I know from my experience in hindsight, 2020, um, just some of the stuff on his site would have helped a lot in the last couple of years of my business before I kind of sold on the downswing. But no, I really appreciate this. We'll have information about um, your programs in the show notes. So everyone, please go listen to it. But um, Mac, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. And, and I, I genuinely love what you're doing. I think you're helping a lot of people and I'm super motivated to be helpful. If people join my programs, great. But, you know, I don't get out of bed every morning thinking about selling or trying to you know, get people. I really want to help people. And I hope that uh, some of the things that we've discussed and maybe some of the things that they would find uh, out on various sites um, really encourage people to take those kind of steps. Because whether they work with me or anyone else or not, just shifting these mindsets really can help create the best outcome. So, so I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to, to chat. Great. Thank you. Talk with you soon. All right. Thanks so much. Wow. That was a great conversation and a real pity that we have to end today's episode of Beyond Eight Figures. But don't worry. I'm sure we'll have a chance to get Mac back on the show soon, even if all we do is talk about football. Meanwhile, if you want to join his program or follow him on his fascinating journey, head over to the show notes down below and get the links. It's well worth your time, believe me. We are working really hard to bring you more amazing interviews with successful founders with their stories. Sign up to the Beyond Eight Figures newsletter to stay updated about upcoming guests, business insights, and all the great opportunities that can help push your business to the next level. Check it out below. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show, and I can't wait to talk to you again soon. Ciao. This episode of Beyond Eight Figures is over, but your journey as an entrepreneur continues. So if we can help you with anything, please just let us know. 
And if you like this episode, please share it with someone who might learn from it. Until next time, keep growing and find the joy in your journey. This is AJ, and I'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.